here are the things that you're going to learn today. You're going to learn how your human psychology can lead you to be irrational. You're going to learn about ICOs and some of the irrationality in that market. And you're going to learn how to build a strategy that can help you win with investing in general. So what is behavioral economics? Behavioral economics is the intersection of psychology and traditional economics. The reason it's important is because traditional economic theory fails to predict a lot of the economic behavior in the real world, because people are irrational and they use certain heuristics that change their behavior. Behavioral economics has won four Nobel Prizes, including last year, Richard Thaler. And it is not only about academics, but it also works in real life. So Professor Thaler has an $8.7 billion fund, and in the past five years, it is in the top one percentile of performers amongst its peers. Tom Howard, who wrote the book Behavioral Portfolio Management, also has the number one fund in his category of ETFs per Morningstar in the past five years. Raise your hand if you think that crypto markets are more rational than the regular stock market. That's what I thought. Zero. There are a lot of reasons why. You can see these up here, but to put it really succinctly, more of the price is driven by the psychological factors, and fewer elements of the asset price are driven by fundamentals. You don't have an entitlement to the revenue of a company. The information comes out 24-7 and is not filtered or restricted or regulated, unlike earnings reports in the traditional stock market. And you can also see evidence of behavioral price distortions and monitor them very easily compared to the traditional markets. So the fundamental reason that behavioral approaches win are that markets are irrational. This is a book on the efficient market hypothesis. And if you look at the prices, you can see why you shouldn't read it. Markets and prices in general can swing wildly on the perception of not very informed people. I don't know if anybody remembers this, but an iced tea company added blockchain to their name and saw their stock shoot up 50 plus percent. So specifically, when we get into cognitive bias and errors in investing, here are some examples. The first is that investors tend to over-diversify. This is something that in traditional portfolio theory people often advise is, you know, be very, very highly diversified. The problem is, as far down as you go, you'll see that generally the best picks by informed investors, if you go by their weighting, tend to do the best. They over-diversify out of fear and loss aversion, and they don't go with a high conviction enough strategy. Investors also sell too early. This is called the disposition effect. They anchor on the price that they bought something, and as a result, they are much more conditionally probable to sell something based on the price movement from where they bought it. When it makes sense to sell something depends on a lot of things, but it shouldn't have too much to do with when you bought it. If the stock's gonna go down or something fundamental has changed, you should sell whether you bought it at the current price, double the current price, or half of the current price. But as you can see, that is not the, the, the case here. Investors also overreact to gains and losses. This is called the recency bias. This is some data from our friends, Nobel Prize winners, Daniel Kahneman and Richard Thaler. And it shows that the worst 10% of stocks by performance in the past five years actually outperform the best 10% performing stocks over that same time frame over the next five years. And the reason for that is that people look too closely at recent performance and not enough at fundamentals. Finally, we have the peak end rule. This is gonna come into play with the, the ICOs, where we remember experiences 
based on the high point and the recent points. And you overgeneralize and miss a lot of the context of the history of that total experience. And this applies also to assets. So here's some data about ICOs, and we're going to see how some of this rationality and irrationality and cognitive bias plays out. The first thing is that ICOs are generally not a good investment. And we use the median here because there are a lot of ICOs. Unfortunately, um, the average can be a little misleading. The average includes stuff like Ethereum and IOTA, projects that um, are not going to repeat themselves in terms of ROI, given how early they were. So if you go with the median, it's a better representation. And the median ICO does quite poorly. So you have to see that unless you have extraordinary discretion or get extraordinary discounts, um, you are not going to do well on average with this type of strategy. Here are some interesting data on how things work with ICOs. I would probably disregard that first line because, again, there are some very early ICOs that didn't raise a lot of money, like SpectreCoin that had a tremendous, tremendous return. But I would look here in this 10 to $20 million range. That seems to be the sweet spot for one reason or another. And a lot of it has to do with having enough resource to drive public interest in the project, but not so much that the market cap starts too high to yield a good return. Token price suspiciously actually matters when it probably shouldn't. Um, again, the super low ones, hard to generalize from because of the, the nature of those early projects. But there seems to be a psychological effect where people think under a dollar is cheap and they drive it up to a dollar, irrespective of the market cap or the technology. Here's something you might find interesting. These are the best performing ICOs by category. There are a lot of categories not here that do really poorly. Advertising, betting, gaming, protocols. These are the good ones. IoT platform, payments, privacy, and exchange. When I say exchange, I mean a centralized one, not a decentralized one. Here are some of the losers. As you can see, just because something makes sense to be integrated with a blockchain technology does not actually mean that it drives ROI for your portfolio. Do not think that these markets are rational. This is probably the most depressing slide for you if you're interested in ICOs. You'll see that the data, even when controlling for time since the ICO has started or ended, returns get worse, even on a relative rate basis. The golden years are sadly behind us. Now, you might say that a negative 44% median return is bad, but it's not bad for everyone. This is a $50 million ICO that I was circulated at one point. And as you can see, they were selling us something or trying to sell us something where it would sell for a dollar and we could buy it for 20 cents. So in the first example of actual rationality in this presentation, you see us being willing to sell something for half of the market price and still locking in a 2.5x multiple return. This is what happens to a lot of retail investors who get caught in that 10%, 0% discount range and wonder where all their money went. So the bottom line here is that ICOs are difficult as an investment strategy. You need to be well connected. You need to get the better projects, allocations, discounts, et cetera, or you should just not try. So that was the early stage market. Let's talk about the later stage market. The first thing to know is this is not easy either. The average hedge fund by Eureka Hedge has lost 41% of your money this year, which is not very good. It's a little bit depressing. The more depressing thing is it, they're actually doing better in relative terms than last year. This year, the market is down 50-some-odd percent. They're down 41 percent. Last year, they were up 17x. The market was actually up 32x. So they underperformed by half. The reason that these folks don't do well is that they are relying a lot upon discretion. And discretion opens you up to a lot of cognitive bias. People want to feel that they are Warren Buffett or the Wolf of Wall Street but 
a preciously small, vanishingly small percentage of us can actually live that reality. So how do smart people do it? Well, if you measure intelligence by Nobel Prizes, this is one way. Richard Thaler's fund happens to take a overreaction and underreaction kind of approach. So when you see news that's good or bad, you see markets over and underreact. And based on your fundamental view, you can see that they'll often revert. So you'll take care of it. Here's a better example. When there is an earnings report that comes out, if there's a surprise, people actually tend to underreact to it in the traditional stock market. They view it as a short-term blip, not a fundamental change in the trajectory of that company's fortune. So Thaler will usually buy on an earnings surprise. He will hang on to it as long as those surprises keep coming as people underreact to the benefit of that positive news and what it foretells and then gets out when there's no longer an earning surprise because that irrationality will then go away. Now, you might say, I've never seen an earnings report for Ethereum, right? But Twitter has quite a similar effect. So you'll see that when projects post a update on Twitter, usually there's some short-term positive price movement and there's usually a reversal shortly thereafter. Sometimes you see the reverse, where an announcement is teased, and the announcement, when it ultimately comes out, is not as good as the hype projected it to be, and the price will tank, creating an opportunity for people to buy, and it bounces back to its normal price range, in this case about 30%, and it creates a great opportunity for people who see the overreaction as nothing more than that. So, you might be saying to yourself, this seems like common sense. This is easy. Unfortunately, it's not in practice. It's emotionally rough on you to do something like saying, my portfolio strategy is to buy the 10% of worst performing stocks over the last five years. And it's emotionally difficult to follow this rules-based approach when you have something in your heart that wants to tell you that you might be able to be Warren Buffett. So what does a rules-based approach look like with crypto? Well, we talked about the overreaction, underreaction, kind of irrationality arbitrage that you see with Richard Thaler. Here's another one. If you look at these, these charts will show you that the pricing of an asset tends to follow the active addresses of the asset. So you can build functions that reveal kind of the underlying basic truth that blockchain assets are networks. Network scale in proportion to the number of nodes, and so does the market capitalization. You can also use that to predict, on a meta level, downturns in the market when the market capitalization far outpaces those active address trends or transaction on chain trends. You could see that that might be a time for a correction if you get out, which looks like those straight lines. In this case, since January last year, you would have had twice as much had you not done so. And this is just merely timing the market with something basic like an index. Taking that to the next level, saying that you want to use something that's rules-based and regimented, formulaic. If you weight your portfolio based on network signals, you do far, far better at basically all points in time over the past year. Right? So that purple line over there, that's a market cap weighted portfolio that tracks the crypto market pretty well. Blue is weighting by the percentage of the network's usage amongst those top 20. And if you weight by the network's growth, that is the traction, the increase on a relative basis, you do even better than that. Right? And this is a very simple rules-based approach where you follow it and you don't put any of your cognitive bias and irrationality into the mix. You're following a rule set. You do not have to use one of these. You can come up with your own strategy. They're just examples, one from us, one from a Nobel Prize winner. But the example here is just to prove the notion that you should not rely on your discretion. So let's wrap it up. Markets may be stupid. They may price an ebook at only $3 cheaper than the hardcover version. But that doesn't mean it's easy to beat them. We saw data, professional hedge funds, 
We saw um, other examples why even though people might um, try to beat the market, it's actually in practice quite hard to do irrationality or no irrationality. You can, however, beat them on average, but you have to build an approach that is rules-based, systematic, and takes into account the errors that are happening in the market. If you can't trust yourself to do this, you should use a fund, an index fund, or a hedge fund, just not one that got killed or underperforms the market and is gonna charge you a fee to do so. And you really should not invest in ICOs unless you have had a great track record and you're getting insane discounts because of how well connected you are. So to close right up and move on to the next bit, my favorite quote here is that the most important lesson of behavioral finance is not that the market's irrational, it's that you are irrational. And by building a rules-based and data-driven strategy, you can take your irrationality out of the equation and prevent yourself from hurting your own portfolio and returns. So that's about it, and I wanna thank you for your time, and let's go to the questions.